This video is supported by Brilliant.org. About a year or so ago, I did a video titled SpaceX vs. NASA. The video, like everything I touch, was awesome. But the title of that video was f***ing stupid. Because SpaceX and NASA aren't competitors, they're partners. SpaceX wouldn't exist without NASA, and NASA needs a lower cost option of getting into space. But also because NASA doesn't really build their rockets. They've always relied on private contractors to build different parts and stages for their rockets. A Saturn V rocket, for example, used dozens of different contractors, including Boeing, North American Aviation, and McDonnell Douglas, which was just Douglas Aviation at the time. It's like saying Ford versus Hertz rental cars. It just, it makes no sense. Man. I was really dumb at the beginning of this channel. So as you can see, the paperclip is attracted to the magnet because the magnet is made of paper. Wake up, sheeple. So while SpaceX is great at grabbing headlines and YouTube videos, they're not NASA's only ride to space. In fact, ULA, the United Launch Alliance, has been America's ride to space for so long, it's, it's literally their slogan. So let's show them a little bit of love and talk about how they've shaped the space race of the past and how they'll continue to be a major player for the future. ULA was formed in 2006, but their pedigree goes all the way back to the very beginnings of the United States Space Program. Because ULA was a merger between the space programs of two different companies, Boeing and Lockheed Martin, and they brought with them two of their flagship rocket families, the Delta and the Atlas rockets. Like most of the rockets in the early space race, uh, the Delta and the Atlas rockets were both originally ICBMs that were made to deliver nuclear weapons to any place in the world. NASA just, you know found another use for them. Atlas rockets flew some of the very first manned missions to space, including John Glenn, the very first man to go into orbit in 1962. And the Delta rockets didn't ever do any manned missions, but they did put up some of the very first weather and communication satellites in the early 60s, which I think we can all agree kind of changed the world. By the way, when I was researching this, I was reminded of the fact that John Glenn was a senator. Did you know that dude was a senator? Like, I remember him being a senator when I was a kid, and I just kind of forgot about it. Now that just blows my mind. I mean. How do you run against John Glenn? I mean, I imagine his campaign slogan was just, John Glenn. Yeah, that John Glenn. You know, oh, sure, he may be a fighter pilot and a war vet and an astronaut and an American hero, but does he know anything about the continuing resolution on the economic disparity of the Pan-Pacific Economic Federation of the Intergovernmental Climate Union? But yeah, the Mercury and Gemini missions used the uh, Redstone, Atlas, and Titan rockets, which were all modified military ICBMs. The first actual rocket that was made specifically to put people into space were the Saturn rockets for Apollo. Literally everything before Apollo was a modified flying death machine. The Delta flying death machine was adapted for space flight in 1960 from a Thor ballistic missile, so the first versions of the rocket are often called the Delta Thor. This was designed and built by the Douglas Aircraft Company, which later became McDonnell Douglas in 1967, which merged with Boeing in 1997. Throughout the 60s, several different versions of the Delta rocket launched all kinds of early satellites and military payloads. These rocket variants were named Delta A through N, yes, there were several of them, and they were all different configurations to serve different purposes. The Delta II first got off the pad in 1989, and the last one flew, wait for it, four months ago. The Delta II was a two-stage rocket whose booster used a single RS-27 engine flanked by solid rocket boosters in the base. Depending on the amount of oomph needed, they could use three, four, or nine solid rocket boosters. The nine version was sometimes called the Heavy. It stood just around 40 meters tall and 2.4 meters in diameter and was considered a light to medium lift rocket capable of carrying up to 6,100 kilograms of low Earth orbit and 2,170 kilograms of geostationary orbit. And it was so reliable that, yeah, they just flew the last version of that in September of 2018, which is a remarkable run. The Delta IV was a major step up from the two, and yes, they skipped the Delta III. My buddy Tim talked about that in the video I'll link here. But the four was 50% taller at 60 meters tall and 5 meters in diameter. It's a medium lift vehicle that can haul up to 12,000 kilograms of low Earth orbit and 7,000 in geostationary orbit. This one launched for the first time in 2002 and is still in service today. These also have the ability to add solid rocket boosters to make them more flexible. But the creme de la creme of the Delta IV is the Delta IV Heavy, a monstrous vehicle that straps three Delta IV cores together, giving it the ability to carry 28,000 kilograms of payload to low Earth orbit or 14,000 geostationary orbit. This is very obviously the same idea that SpaceX had with the Falcon Heavy, an idea that according to Wikipedia, they first started talking about in 2004. 2004 also coincidentally happens to be the first time that the Delta IV Heavy launched, so, you know. I'm not saying Elon stole the idea from ULA, but he did definitely steal the idea from ULA. 
if it's any consolation that Falcon Heavy can carry more payload, plus there's the whole reusability thing, so there's that. So currently the Delta IV and the Delta IV Heavy are still a part of the ULA rocket lineup with 37 launches and only one partial launch due to a failure in the second stage. These are widely considered some of the most powerful and reliable rockets in the entire world. So now let's talk about the Atlas rockets. As I said before, the first Atlas rockets were ICBMs. They were built in the 50s by Corvair, an aerospace division of General Dynamics, which was bought out by Lockheed Martin in 1996. More than 350 Atlas rockets were built for military purposes, but they soon concluded that a different rocket performed that function better, so the Atlas rockets were mostly used for space exploration. The first one went up in December of 1957, and one year later in 1958, launched the first satellite capable of beaming television signals, which President Eisenhower used to broadcast a Christmas message all around the world. His first manned mission was the famed Friendship 7 mission with John Glenn, but it also carried out three more manned missions before the end of the program. The Atlas went on to deliver payloads for both commercial and military applications all through the 60s, 70s, and 80s in a number of different configurations, including the LV, the SLV, and the G. These were paired with a couple of different second stages, the Agena and Centaur rockets, so the pairing was often referred to as Atlas Agena and Atlas Centaur. The Agena was actually pivotal in the Gemini program as they figured out how to rendezvous and dock in space. Some of the first tests were actually done with what they called the Agena target vehicle. And the Centaur second stage has been used through various generations since 1963. It's evolved quite a bit over time, but it is still in use today. It was 1991 when the original Atlas was replaced with the Atlas II, followed by the Atlas III in the year 2000. This proved to be something of a transitional vehicle as the Atlas V began flights in 2002 and is still flying today. The Atlas V comes in two variants, the Atlas V 400 with a 4 meter fairing and the capacity to fit up to three solid rocket boosters, and the Atlas V 500 with a 5.4 meter fairing that can use up to five solid rocket boosters and carry up to 20,000 kilograms in a low Earth orbit. And between these two variants, they can be customized 19 different ways, so again, lots of flexibility there. The Atlas V has flown 79 times. Some of the more notable missions include the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, the New Horizons spacecraft, and OSIRIS-REx. And through those 79 missions, the number of failures they've had is a whopping zero. Literally a perfect record. Which is why, as NASA is gearing up this year to put people in space again as part of the commercial crew program, they opted to put the Boeing Starliner on top of the Atlas V rocket, making it the first time an Atlas has put a human in space since 1963. Everything old is new again. So ULA has dominated the space launch industry for a very, very long time, uh, but you might have heard of some disruptors that have popped up in recent years, so they have definitely had to change with the times. There was a major restructuring at ULA in 2014 to make the company leaner and meaner, and along the way they also introduced a new rocket that's more capable of competing with companies like SpaceX, the Vulcan rocket. The Vulcan rocket is going to be loaded with all kinds of amazing technology, including pointy ears, the ability to read minds, and the ability to incapacitate somebody by simply squeezing on the, oh, wait, sorry, wrong Vulcan. ULA's Vulcan rocket is designed to be modular, semi-reusable, which I'll get to in just a second, and super flexible with the ability to handle everything from low Earth orbit to the moon to long distance deep space missions. And they're doing this by both pioneering new technologies and dusting off some old school tech. The booster stage allows for up to six solid rocket boosters, tried and true technology that rockets have used for decades for a little extra oomph to get off the ground. These are expendable but smaller, so less waste. The booster itself is powered by two BE-4 engines designed and built by Blue Origin. I talked in a video a while back about Blue Origin and how the BE-4, which is a methane oxygen engine, might be one of the most powerful liquid propelled rockets in the world. This might actually be what puts Blue Origin on the map which is why the Vulcan is expected to put up to 34,000 kilograms in a low Earth orbit. And this is an especially big deal considering that they've used engines from Aerojet Rocketdyne since the 60s. So this is very much new tech that they want to get as much reuse out of as possible, but unlike SpaceX and Blue Origin, which do propulsive landings, they have a totally different idea in mind. They're going to save the engines and just ditch the rest of the booster. It turns out the engines are only 20% of the weight, but they're 65% of the cost of the booster. The rest of the booster is really just fuel tank, so they're just going to ditch that part and save the expensive part. So once the booster lets go of the second stage, the engine module at the bottom of the booster detaches and initiates an inflatable heat shield, or as they call it, the hypersonic inflatable aerodynamic decelerator. This helps guide the engines back to Earth. Now this isn't traveling at orbital velocity, so this is not like a heat shield you'd see on a capsule. This just kind of helps protect the engine module and guide it back to Earth in a controlled fashion. This is a brand new concept, by the way, so new tech here. Now, if that sounds crazy, it gets even cray crazier because what happens next is they deploy a parafoil, which is like a parachute, but it's more steerable, and then they do a mid-air recovery. They literally fly a helicopter over the parafoil, trailing a giant hook, and just snatch it out of the air. 
And by the way, this is actually some old school technology. This is what they did way back in the day before spy satellites could just beam down the images. They actually recorded the images on film and they re-entered the atmosphere and they snatched it out of the air to keep it from landing on the ground and falling into the wrong hands. This entire system is what they call Smart Recovery, which stands for Sensible Modular Autonomous Reuse Technology. And on one hand, this does seem kind of like a convoluted mess, but on the other hand, by just recovering the engines, you get to use all of the fuel to get up into space, which gives you more power and more flexibility to take your rocket as far as you need it to go. Now that's all the first stage. The second stage in the beginning is probably just gonna be a modified Centaur second stage, but there is a new second stage that they're working on that they call ACES, which stands for Advanced Cryogenic Evolved Stage. ACES takes this usually neglected second stage and gives it more to do, making it possible to do multiple different things while it's up in space. The specialized cryogenic hull and coatings prevents the fuel, which is kept at extremely cold temperatures, from venting off into space, meaning that the stage can be used for days on end as opposed to only being ditched into the sea after a few burns. It also presents the opportunity to refuel in space, meaning ACES could get topped off to head off to the moon or the outer solar system, or it could drop off multiple satellites in multiple orbits, maybe even capture and deorbit old satellites. Maybe. I kind of made that last one up. But maybe. They estimate that the ACES stage would give them 30% more capabilities than the current Delta IV heavy rocket. The first Vulcan rocket is scheduled to go up in April of 2021, so we got a couple years on this, but I don't know about you, I'm excited to see what this thing does. When I was a kid, I was a bit of a space history nerd, as you can probably imagine. I knew all the different astronauts from Mercury all the way through Apollo. I knew all the mission numbers. I knew all the rockets that were flown. And while the names of the companies might have changed over the years, I gotta say, there's something I really like about seeing Delta and Atlas rockets still taking off. And the fact that an Atlas rocket is soon gonna take people into space again, I think is just so cool. So while ULA might sometimes be painted as the old corporate stalwarts that you know, are ripe for disruption by plucky startups like SpaceX and Blue Origin, their place in the history of the space travel is gigantic, and they still got a big role to play in the future. And for that, I am grateful. The history of spaceflight is the history of solving problems. And if you'd like to work on your problem solving skills, there's a new thing at brilliant.org that you might want to check out. I've talked about Brilliant quite a bit on this channel, but they've actually got something new and interesting and worth checking out. It's called Daily Problems, which is there to help you to create a daily learning habit. Every day they publish several problems that provide a unique perspective on math, logic, science, or engineering. Figure out how the ancients track time, how to build a solar sail, or escape a room by outwitting the guards. And as always with Brilliant, they walk you through the process with extra puzzles, plus there's a community of members to help you so you're not alone. Of course, subscribers to their premium membership get access to this and all their courses, and viewers of this channel, if you go to brilliant.org slash answers with Joe, the first 200 people to sign up get 20% off your subscription for life. I like it a lot, I think you will too. Brilliant.org slash answers with Joe, links in the description. Big thanks to Brilliant for supporting this video, and a big thanks to my Patreons, my answer files on Patreon who are supporting this channel. I've got some new people that have joined, let me murder their names real quick. Jan Michael Johansson, Leigh Gilly, Jeff Tyler, Scott Boone, Jerry Legrau, Eric Storis, Lynn, Wes Townsend, Shelly Gold, Jedi Davian, Joseph Davis, Chris Bryson Meister, uh, Dan Doyle, Thomas Friend, uh, PhD, or maybe it's Tomas, uh, Oren Hayes, Christoph Canton, Brian Zhu, Ben Polzin, Jose Angel Barrientos, Wellington Cumbernero, nailing this, Prodigal Sons, Lincoln, and Angus Keenan. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. There are many people that I still need to get to. Just uh, give me some time, I'm working on it. If you would like to join them, you can go to uh, patreon.com slash answerswithjoe. T-shirts available at the store, answerswithjoe.com slash shirts. I thought this was relevant to today's episode. There's all kinds of fun and geeky stuff there. I think you will like it. I know I do. All right, thanks again for watching. You guys go out now, have an eye-opening week, and I'll see you on Monday. Love you guys. Take care.